Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the joint session of the CSIS and the ITIF uh, program uh, for today. Um, a program that uh, we uh, pr it, it promises to be a fascinating discussion about innovation and intellectual property and the role they have played in combating the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, as uh, we all know, we have, the whole world has been living and uh, with, with this global pandemic for the past uh, two years. And uh, we have all gone through ups and downs. Um, but when it comes to uh, how to cope with the pandemic, technology uh, of all sorts has uh, played a humongous role. Uh, for example, the fact that we're doing this very program and so many other programs through video conferencing uh, although some of the technology has been around for quite some time, uh, these types of technologies have really helped uh, all of us uh, cope uh, with, uh, with the pandemic. But most importantly, uh, innovation has played a tremendously significant role in developing vaccines and therapeutics and all sorts of other medical treatments uh, with, uh, uh, for, for the pandemic. And uh, we have a fascinating panel um assembled from around the world in order to discuss different perspectives uh surrounding innovation and intellectual property from different jurisdictions from different countries uh, and different organizations as to uh as to how each one of us views uh the role of uh innovation and ip when it comes uh to these technologies so uh very briefly let me introduce the panel uh but i do want to emphasize that uh, the way we're going to do this is um we're going to engage in a conversation with the panel if members of the audience have questions uh please do let us know uh um uh, through the uh, chat function so uh first of all we have uh with us uh marco uh, aleman uh, uh, Director uh, uh, Aleman is the Assistant Director General at WIPO, the World Int uh, Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, where he is responsible for helping member states develop uh, their IP and innovation ecosystems to drive uh, economic growth. Uh, second, we have uh, Jayashri Watal. Um, uh, Ms. Watal is uh, currently a, um, an adjunct, uh, adjunct professor at uh, uh, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Uh, she's had many roles uh, prior, prior to this, um, and uh, I'm not going to do it justice, but uh, just uh, very briefly, uh, she uh, has spent uh, uh, a couple of decades in the service of the government of, uh, of India. She uh, has served on the governance board of the medicines patent pool in Geneva. Uh, she has um, represented India in the negotiations of the TRIPS agreement, uh, which we're going to talk about in some detail during the program today. Um, and uh, she has written extensively um, on intellectual property rights in the context of the World Trade Organization um uh, the wto we also have with us uh, chris uh, hattings uh chris uh is uh, the project manager at the free market uh, foundation and uh, he does a lot of um, academic and thought leadership when it comes to consumer rights economic freedom inequality intellectual freedom uh and the like in um uh in in south africa um, and I don't know yet if we have uh, with us uh, Carlos Roa. Um, uh, we were supposed to, uh, but... Uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Hi, Carlos. Uh, uh, Carlos uh, is from the Instituto Inos uh, in, um, in, in Colombia, 
uh, he has spent um, uh, many years uh, in uh, leading and implementing uh, change uh, and uh, innovation uh, when it comes to science and technology education. Um, he has, um, uh, he has, uh, he's one of the uh, founders of the ELITE program, the Latin American School of Engineers, Technologists, and Entrepreneurs um, uh, in, uh, in Bogota, uh, Colombia. Okay, so with that very brief introduction, uh, let me uh, start with um, uh, Director uh, Aleman, um, let, let's just start the discussion at a high level and specifically with the announced topic uh, of the day, which is uh, talk a little bit about the role of intellectual property in facilitating global, so international development uh, of and production of COVID-19 technologies, including vaccines, therapeutics, and everything else. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Andre Yanku, uh, for uh, this very kind invitation and for your role as moderator of the panel. And I'm very glad with uh, CSIS and ITIF uh, for this uh, very kind invitation. In a in few minutes, uh, some of my consideration around the role of IP uh, probably divided in three, three different levels. Few are general issues on innovation in the time of COVID, um, and then a few more concrete issues on the specific role of, of IP. So a few general comments are, are related to reflect how uh, in investment in, in science and innovation have been remarkably resilient in the face of the greatest uh, economic downturn for decades. Um, a specific output, research and development um, expenditure, both government and private, uh, international patent filings and venture capital deals continued to grow in 2020, despite the very difficult um, uh, situation. And particularly, companies whose innovations were at the center of measures to contain the pandemic and its um, fallout, notably pharmaceuticals and ICTs, uh, redoubled their investments in, um, in innovation, while Certainly, uh, some of the sector get negatively affected. But something important to mention here is that the um, innovation growth rate in 2019, that is the, the year we have all the data available, grew at 8.5%. And regarding 2020, that is uh, a period in which we have partial data um, available, shows that there are very optimistic reasons to think that it will continue to grow despite the um, uh, general economic situation. Few reasons to be optimistic. The first one is the nature of the crisis itself. The impact of the crisis has been highly uneven across industries and um, innovation was at the very heart of the response to the pandemic. And second, the limited available data we, we have in our hands shows that both government expenditure on innovation and corporate expenditure, 1,700 of the out of the 2,500 companies that reported expenditure on innovation and research and, 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 and development in particular, shows that 60% of those companies increase the overall expenditure in research and, uh, and development. So what we have um, um, in, in front of us is a clear demonstration of how in this very difficult situation, innovation data shows an increase in the effort made both by government and private se sector in terms of innovation. Now, let me turn to the more specific issue of um, how the COVID-19 vaccine success can be in itself an innovation policy model for many reasons. The first one, the COVID crisis prompted responses to find solutions urgently from all actors in the innovation ecosystem. 
governments, private sector, research institutions, universities, international community, NGOs, and even philanthropic foundations mobilize themselves to together deal with the challenges of this uh, uh, pandemic. And the scale of the pandemic and the fact that uh, it affects a large share of the population created in itself a crucial innovation incentive for the private sector. In addition, several governments gave significant financial support to the private sector. And finally, let me mention how the public-private collaboration in quickly identifying and development and developing the vaccines and the therapeutics shows um, without any doubt what in my view uh, will be one of the driving forces of innovation in the futures uh, to come. So we have many things to learn um, on the way the different actors of the ecosystems behave in this pandemic. But let me in this general comment, show something that, in my view, is extremely um, um, uh, important in, 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 in relation to innovation in, in these times of COVID. And is this clear uh, alignment in between private interests and social interests. In a research we have conducted in WIPO, we estimate that the social benefit of the vaccine innovation amounts to 70.5 trillions globally, exceeding the private benefit that accounts for about 80, 80 billion. An impressive amount, of course, for the private sector, but more impressive, the social benefit and the social return of the vaccine. So this is an example in, 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 in which um, the interests of private sector and the society at large align, of course, a number of challenges remain, and we know which are those challenges in areas like scaling up production and access to the vaccine in different regions of the world. But the innovation model itself proved to be very positive. In a few minutes, allow me to mention concrete elements of the role of the IP. In a report we published in the first quarter of 2022, a patent landscaping report in COVID, look at into the first available data on patenting activity in the area of COVID. As you know, we have the limits of only having access to patents already published. And, and because of that, when we conducted the study with the deadline of October 2021, a number of patents at that period were not yet uh, published. So based on the initial findings of the report, we can mention the following. There have been a significant use and response of the IP system to COVID-19 during the first uh, one and a half year of the pandemic. And this is reflected in the following. First, a notable patenting activity in which is expected to grow and data will show this growing uh, very soon. The patenting activity that we identify cover 5,300 patent uh, families. Um, that mention directly or indirectly either COVID or the SARS-CoV-2, including diagnostic, mask, and therapeutics. About 1,500 patent filings were about therapeutics, and about 500 patent families were related to vaccine uh, developments. If we compare this data, and we take the example of influenza in the last 70 years, the total filing for influenza in the last 70 years is about 500 filings. So it shows the mobilization and, and the way the patent system plays a role in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The second element, it was a very quick response from patent offices worldwide of the parent system to deal with this very concrete situ situation. The first patent data coming from the pandemic shows an early 
equal contribution of companies, I mean private sector and academia to, to uh, both contributing to different technologies to deal with the COVID-19. The report for the includes vaccine technologies milestones that took place before the pandemic and which were the main enabler of the accelerated innovation that took place on the pandemic. And this is again another contribution of the patent system because all those developments took place before the pandemic arrived. Third, innovation related to the COVID-19 refers to both conventional and new technologies. In the field of vaccine, the conventional vaccine category, for example, of proteins to the unit vaccines, is the largest category in the data set, with nearly half of the vaccine patent filing, about 46%. The novel vaccine technology has a lower but yet notable contribution to the data set, with about 35% of the total uh, filing, and the RNA, about 12% of the total um, filing. In the field of therapeutics, an estimated 80% of the therapeutics are the so-called repurposed therapeutic products as it comes from the available clinical data information we have, and it covers again both novel approaches and traditional, um, um, typical uh, pharmaceutical uh, products. I will not get into details of that, but in my view, these three very general comments shows how the patent system, without any doubt, plays a very key role in the innovation taking place um, during uh, the pandemic, but very, very important, the, inno the, the innovation taking place before the pandemic that allows a very quick answer during the pandemic. Uh, back to you, uh, Mr. Iancu, um, and many thanks for giving me the chance. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Marco. That, I mean, the, the super interesting uh, statistics. And um, uh, just a point of clarification, the various numbers you gave, are these filings at WIPO under the Patent Cooperation Treaty, the PCT, or are the numbers reflecting uh, global filings at the member states as well? Those numbers reflect what we call patent families. And, and because of that, those families are not only related to PCT, but then in many occasions, they are integrated, of course, for more than one key filing. It could be Europe, US, uh, and other key technology uh, origin of the technology to compose those families. So we have in, in WIPO, in our WIPO statistic data center, a uh, definition of what is a parent family, and we use that definition to get to the amount of filings I am mentioning and quoting today. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, and we're going to come back for a, a, a more Q&A at the end of the uh, various uh, panelists. Uh, let me turn it now to Jayashree Watal. And um, it's, um, uh, and let me ask you this, uh, Jayashree. So um, Director Aleman, uh talks about um, all the various patent filings and the robust response um, from an IP perspective to the pandemic. I found super interesting that there is so much more, so many more applications here as compared to influenza, for example. Um, but um, some people in the world argue that that uh, so some people will say that that is a very good thing. It just shows uh, how much innovation there is and people are protecting their innovation and they're incentivized to innovate. Other people are arguing that all those IP filings potentially can act as a barrier to access to the various technologies invented um, uh, and, and, and protected in these patent filings. So I want to start getting into that discussion a little bit and what the world response has been to that, to that debate between IP incentivizing innovation and IP potentially acting as a barrier. Um, but to do that, let's talk a little bit about the international treaties that are at play here. 
Let's talk a bit about the TRIPS agreement and then also the various proposals to waive the protections, intellectual property protections that are subject to TRIPS. So first fundamental question, what is the TRIPS agreement in the first place? <laughs> Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, thanks also to the CSIS and the ITIF, especially Stephen Ezel at the ITIF. I'm really delighted to be here with you, Andre, just a year after the first CSIS yeah. panel uh, discussion that you chaired on IP. <laughs> However, I'm a bit depressed at where we are in the public debate about IP and the needed medical countermeasures to rapidly contain uh, this pandemic, COVID-19. I'm depressed because we seem to be at the same stage we were a year back. And uh, like you said, let me begin, given my background, uh, having worked in the WTO secretariat for around two decades, I'd like to address uh, the TRIPS agreement. As you said, not many people are familiar, even with the acronym TRIPS. It stands for the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights. And it is the single most comprehensive international agreement on intellectual property, having minimum standards of protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights, such as copyright, patents, trademarks, industrial designs, trade secrets, and so on. So the, the intellectual property rights that are most relevant to our discussion, health-related intellectual property rights, are patents, uh, to some extent trademarks, to a, to a large extent trade secrets, and test data protection, that is clinical data, uh, regulatory data protection. Although copyright and industrial designs have also been used for, uh, for medical, uh, these medical countermeasures that we're talking about. But alongside the minimum standards that TRIPS lays down, TRIPS also allows for certain exceptions and limitations to intellectual property. For instance, the grant of compulsory licenses, that is licenses given to third parties without the authorization of the right holder for any reason whatsoever. Uh, uh, so this is a very big uh, so-called policy flexibility that is contained in the TRIPS agreement. And more recently, the TRIPS agreement has been amended to also allow for 100% of export, exports of patented pharmaceuticals, including vaccines, under a compulsory license to other WTO members who cannot produce them or make them. So in the case of trade secrets, I'd like to clarify that unlike patents, trade secrets do not grant any exclusivity. Protection is only against theft of trade secrets or acquisition of such secrets by dishonest commercial means. Uh, so there's no protection against independent discovery, for instance, uh, of these protected trade secret protected products or processes. That in itself is uh, the very big difference between trade secrets and other exclusive intellectual property rights. Now, let me quickly turn to uh, the so-called TRIPS waiver proposal submitted by uh, initially by South Africa and India, first in October 2020 and then revised in uh, May 2021. Their proposal was to temporarily waive TRIPS obligations related to patents, copyrights, industrial designs, trade secrets, and test data protection for a fixed period of time uh, from the date uh, the decision is taken at the WTO. There is no decision yet on this. Uh, this is being negotiated, but the co-sponsors now numbering over 60 co-sponsors of this proposal with many more supporters in the WTO argue, as Andre said, that such a waiver of intellectual property rights would facilitate uh, the prevention, containment, treatment of COVID-19, the use of these medical countermeasures that I was talking about. So they believe that it would also accelerate the equitable spread in the production and distribution of these uh, countermeasures, such as vaccines, therapeutics, tests, kits, diagnostics, and, and so on. And so that low and middle income countries could start producing them in their own countries and, and thus not be subject to uh, the vagaries of the market or supply chains or policies to restrict exports and so on, which have happened uh, during this pandemic. 
they've also argued that this WTO authorized 100% export compulsory license that I refer to is difficult to implement in practice and has only been used once. And therefore, uh, TRIPS is not up to speed when it comes to uh, use of uh, these policy measures uh, during a pandemic. So that is the argument of the proponents and their supporters. On the other side, uh, those countries, especially those that are owners, uh, that are hosts to companies that have the patents on these COVID countermeasures, uh, they argue that uh, no such thing is necessary, that the TRIPS agreement does not need to be waived or, or uh, modified in any way. However, the European Union has submitted a counter proposal in the WTO and its counter proposal basically focuses on compulsory licensing provisions mainly uh, uh, to waive certain of these provisions or to tweak them in some way so that these are easier to use, uh, especially in relation to this 100% export compulsory licenses. A compromise text is in the process, in the work, so to speak, and a leaked version of this is in the public domain. Now, I don't want to get into the details of this text because it's not a final text. And uh, even those who, are, who, are, who were around the table to negotiate it claim uh, that uh, have distanced themselves, let's say, have distanced themselves from this text. But given my experience uh, with negotiations, trade negotiations in general and negotiations in the WTO, I see clear signs, uh, telltale signs, I would say, that this is a negotiated text. Obviously, a negotiated text is not to everybody's liking, and, and that is why it's uh, strategic to distance themselves from the text. We have yet to see what's going to come out of it. Now, today, in the third year of COVID-19, we know we, we all acknowledge uh, that there is an urgent need for more effective action at the global level to contain the pandemic. That, that's for sure. We shouldn't be in the third year of this pandemic. And people living anywhere in the world should be fully protected against this virus, be it through vaccines, therapeutics, and so on, including any of these emerging variants. Yet we are not in that position. And paradoxically, we are in a position uh, in a world which has a COVID-19 vaccine surplus, so much so that vaccine manufacturers are either stopping production altogether or significantly so slowing down production, even as many low and low middle income countries, for instance, in Africa, have a vaccination rate of well below 20% of their entire population, sometimes even priority, uh, you know, populations such as health workers uh, or those who are particularly vulnerable uh, have not been vaccinated in many countries around the world, low-income and low-middle-income countries around the world. Why is this? Uh, a, a, a recent uh, paper that has come out of uh, the IMF uh, basically has said this is because of low absorptive capacity in these countries due to multiple factors poor logistics in terms of you know, refrigeration and getting vaccines from airports or uh, airport tarmacs to, to the arms of people, you know, uh, just poor logistics, inadequate healthcare infrastructure, and on top of it, a lot of vaccine hesitancy. So, uh, so access to these needed medical products clearly requires multi-pronged action at the international level. Now, how important the intellectual property waiver proposal in the WTO is in relation to other proposals that are on the table for the international community is a moot point. Now, what are these other proposals? I mean, it's, it's uh, basically in the WHO that there is an alternative, or let's say not an alternative, but another proposal. Um, you know, there have been, there've been many calls and a recognition that the global architecture for health uh, the, 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 that the international community has at its disposal has in, in some way failed us. Despite the WHO having recognized the problem very early on in the pandemic and launched or backed several uh, very good initiatives, including the vaccine equity arm of its Act A, 
uh, uh, namely COVAX, which has which has struggled and is now coming up to speed in distributing vaccines at a time where now <laughs> very few uh, want it. I mean, the offtake is very low. Member states in the WHO are preparing to negotiate a new international instrument for pandemic preparedness and response, including uh, modifying the existing international health regulations. Now, these negotiations are scheduled to take at least a couple more years and may well extend <laughs> beyond that, because as we know, I mean, my experience with international negotiations is deadlines are practically always missed. So uh, is this the solution to actually dealing urgently with what we know is a deadly, uh, a deadly pandemic uh, causing huge economic losses of trillions of dollars uh, to the to the global economy? So is the IP waiver, coming back to the IP waiver, is the IP waiver necessary? Is that what is going to help to get uh, more uh, development or deployment of these medical countermeasures such as diagnostics, vaccines, therapeutics, and so on? In my view, waiving these international IP obligations at the WTO is completely unnecessary, given that the TRIPS agreement already contains policy flexibilities that I mentioned, such as compulsory licensing or even parallel imports, where it is possible, where it is feasible, and so on. These can be used readily. The TRIPS agreement does not, in my view, require urgently any modifications or waivers. Nevertheless, I do believe that in this leaked TRIPS waiver text, there are some attractive features which simplify, uh, for instance, exports under a compulsory license. And those should not be scoffed at, you know, uh, because it is possible that in a few months from now, who knows, uh, uh, another version of mRNA vaccines, you know, the much in demand mRNA vaccines uh, by Pfizer and, and Moderna might really be coming out of countries like China and uh, or India or, or Thailand, you know, uh, there are preparations going on to, to get uh, these kind of vaccines out with additional uh, attractive features such as not requiring cold chains and so on. So maybe there is still, uh, you know, uh, kind of, um, um, there is still scope for making it easy to export uh, these, these kind of uh, vaccines for which, as I said, the instrument is already in place. But in my view, voluntary action by originator companies, either voluntary licenses, bilaterally, through the MPP, subcontracting, other manufacturers, etc., has been the best way forward. So far with vaccines, uh, manufacturers have chosen other uh, that is, originators have chosen other manufacturers in low and middle income countries such as India, South Africa, China, and so on to partner with, whether it be AstraZeneca or, or Johnson & Johnson. Um, and even uh, there have been statements uh, from uh, those who are manufacturing their mRNA vaccines that they would like to partner with others uh, in Africa, for example. So, um, sorry, you want to cut me short now? Well, no, let me just uh, follow up on one of the things that you just said. Um, okay. So, uh, first of all, with respect to the leaked text uh, suggesting that there is some sort of a compromise uh, afoot between India, South Africa, European mm -hmm. Union, and the United States, all four of those jurisdictions have disavowed the text, I believe, which... Yes which clearly suggests to me that uh, that there is an, a, um, a potential agreement in sight uh, <laughs> if they took if they took the uh, time to do that but um, but if as you say um, it's not necessary at this point because number one the trips agreement already contains compulsory licensing provisions number two there are lots of other reasons, um, such as infrastructure, hesitancy, and the like, for uh, a lack of equal access uh, around the world and so on. Why do you believe, at least these four countries and uh, obviously everybody else, why 
are they still pursuing this waiver path? Mm -hmm. Good point. Very, very good question, Andre. Um, you know, the world, the world uh, as a whole, many influential opinion makers in the world backed the waiver proposal quite early on and then mounted immense pressure to the extent that uh, a country that has traditionally been uh, backing strong intellectual property protection internationally uh, caved in, I mean, I would say, which is, uh, which is the USA uh, and said, we will back a waiver. And from that point onwards, which was May 2021, uh, it became clear that there would have to be some result in the WTO. And it was in June 2021 that the European Union then gave a counter proposal. I mean, that's the way negotiations are most constructively uh, conducted, where others give counter proposals and then there is a kind of a, a negotiation uh, concerning both or as many proposals as there are on the table and you narrow it down to, uh, to an agreement that everyone can live with. That, that's the way it happens uh, uh, at the WTO and elsewhere. So, uh, so the pressure to have some solution come out of the WTO is too high for us at this point to back away and say, we're never going to do anything at all. Okay, uh, so that is uh, a, a practical uh, <laughs> reasoning why we are pursuing and it, it, it is going to be pursued up to the ministerial, uh, which is scheduled for June this year at the WTO ministerial. And if a test if a solution is not found before that, uh, it has to be found at the ministerial. You know, there will be huge amount of pressure for that to be done. So uh, all I'm saying is that given the fact that rightly or wrongly, the international community backed this or spent so much of its political capital on finding a solution in the WTO, uh, it, it's, it's going to happen. And if that is the case, there is something to be gained by making some uh, of the procedures a little easier, you know, uh, the flexibility is already there, no harm in making it a little easier during the pandemic, uh, where people have complained, um, rightly or wrongly, I mean, that some of these instruments cannot be used uh, very quickly, and so on. Understood. Thank you, uh, Jayashree. Let me turn it uh, to Carlos, and I want to remind the audience, you can ask questions in the um, uh, in the, at the CSIS event page, ask live questions button, or also the link in the YouTube chat if you're watching. Um, okay, uh, Carlos, if I can turn to you and, uh, and let me just ask you from, uh, from the point of view of, of developing countries, um, uh, what it, do, do developing countries, would, would the waiver in some form benefit uh, developing countries vis-a-vis -vis access, not just only to COVID-19 vaccines, but also in the future access to other uh, important uh, medicines and healthcare technologies. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here with such a great panel of uh, uh, people. So uh, let, let, let me start saying uh, I'm based in Colombia. Um, and uh, well, Marco knows very well all the context that we live in in, in our country uh, during the pandemic. But uh, let me start um, uh, by this uh, uh, and addressing your question to to Yashuri regarding wh uh, why so many countries are there. And I would say the simple question is fear. Yeah, because because we were everywhere in the world, everybody very very. Uh, with, with a lot of fear regarding what was uh, happening. But, uh, but in the second place, I would say uh, it's a misunderstanding on what is innovation and the value of innovation in healthcare. Let me, let me, let me tell you that in, uh, in our task as a think tank, uh, focusing in the future and the innovation in healthcare for the future of our healthcare system, uh, we have been very, very intensive in trying to clarify this to all the actors of the healthcare science and technology ecosystem. Uh, first thing, uh, regarding the study you, you, you use, uh, 50 to 60% of the things, uh, call it uh, medical devices, supplies, uh, uh, drugs, et cetera, that, that we use, 
that we enjoy uh, in the healthcare provision as medical doctors and patients uh, comes from an, and are here for our use because the patent system. Yeah, and that, that is something that curiously, when you talk uh, with uh, people like me, I, I was rector of this big university focused in healthcare. We don't know. And, and, and I did our research here in, in, in Colombia and uh, almost none healthcare uh, or medicine program or nursery program or dentistry program has a focus and, and, and on a, a good background in understanding the value of uh, a patent system and, 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 and for innovation in healthcare. So we live in a, in a world in which we don't know uh, what has been the habilitating factor to make us enjoy, uh, enjoy and use the kind of tools that we use for, for our patients. And that explains also why uh, some of the most, uh, let's say, resilient uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, well, uh, people who, who, who attack, attack the patent system come from the health uh, care uh, professions uh, uh, themselves. So, so this is a very, very important. I have said to my, my uh, medicine students, if you don't like IP, you should not be studying in medicine because you would like you would need to uh, live in a world without tools to treat your patients and to make their lives better. So this is a very important mission, and I think that uh, Marcos has uh, uh, a lot of clarity about how important it is uh, for uh, the YPO uh, and everywhere to make understand this to uh, universities that are developing human human talent. Having said that, yeah. What we have seen in emerging countries like uh, like my country is that very soon in in the in the, in the pandemic uh, uh, there started to emerge these initiative initiatives. We have a a, a proposal of uh, an uh, an act in the Congress that uh, proposed not only uh, um, uh, well the, this this waiving of of uh, and uh, um, um, uh, let's say compulsory licenses etc cetera, etc cetera, but uh, but also let's say creating a huge um, uh, uh, facility, public facility uh, that uh, starts to uh, produce vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a typical response when you say we have fear, we need to do something to respond and and uh, and to start getting uh, getting things. We as a think tank analyze this and we say, oh, take care with this. We cannot promise the people that we are going to be self-sufficient in terms of, uh, of production, that we are going to put all these things together, finance them, have the people producing the vacuum and have uh, all the things uh, uh, ready uh, for uh, to respond to to the to the pandemic. So I think that that they uh, and 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 this conversation in which we involved uh, well people from our uh, think tank, but also people from government, from uh, the pharma industry, uh, people from uh, other regions of the world. I think um, help us uh, to support that this act of law should be let's say uh, abandoned. And uh, and uh, not continue the way it, it was moving because it was gaining a lot of 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 of, uh, of momentum because everybody was demanding the government to to move up. So fortunately, I think that um, uh, putting this kind of evidence help us to to move things in, in a in a better way. And I think that the government did it very well. It recognized that there's there was a very important uh, line to. Uh, acquire, negotiate vaccines, uh, bring them, and and distribute them in a in a way that you bring uh, equity in the distribution. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm proud to say that that, that our government here in Colombia uh, developed a very uh, 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 um, uh, savvy um, uh, vaccination strategy with equity for 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 the people. So so that line worked, but simultaneously, very soon, the government start to do. Uh, scientific diplomacy, starting to do agreements with the big uh, industry in the India, in Korea, in, in the U.S., establishing treaties, and then starting to move this conversation in the country, which, which was what, our, what is our position, is we need to work together as an ecosystem between private and public sector, between local industry and international, multinational industry, uh, working together in terms to accelerate the process and be better prepared for this case for the next pandemic. Yeah. So right now we have some months ago, a couple of months ago, regarding this momentum, the country has started the building of a new plant uh, uh, for producing uh, uh, producing vaccines starting next year. 
um, first phase, uh, we, we, uh, there was a split in the, in the strategy. Uh, first out, uh, fill and finish strategy, their, their uh, knowledge uh, uh, transfer phase, and then uh, research, pure research and development uh, phase. So, so I think that's the correct way, working together and uh, not all putting this, because if you move in, 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 this, in this mind frame, uh, of the of the of the uh, mind from that the river was uh, proposing i think that definitely you give a bad signal for, as a developing country uh, to make this kind of uh, collaboration uh, between industry uh, public sector uh, academia and of course international and and local uh, industry i think that uh, global industry farming industry is convinced that uh, they need to decentralize production, that was one of the main uh, uh, obvious conclusions. And uh, uh, well, for uh, uh, emerging countries, should give signals that we are prepared to receive this uh, uh, multilateral strategy to accelerate uh, uh, and decentralize a, a global production. It would make sense for everything. So getting getting involved in this mind frame, I think, is necessary, and uh, bringing and and the signals to governments to get involved in the, what the uh, um, uh, World Health Organization should be better prepared for, for the next pandemic. I think that it, 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 it was not the kind of uh, preparedness that uh, it should be. And now get involved in these initiatives that are emerging uh, for a global treaty on, uh, uh, on the next pandemic, which involves not only, let's say, the development of vaccines or some drugs, but the whole concept of uh, sanitary safeness. We need to be prepared for everything that comes. Lack of human resources, uh, lack of uh, facilities, a, a lack of raw materials, uh, supplies, and of course, vaccines. And uh, But all of that needs a strong IP system because that's the rule of the games in which uh, uh, what we can move. Carlos, do you think there is a recognition in government, uh, in Colombia and other Latin American governments that intellectual property protections are part of the solution to all of the issues that you have discussed with respect to uh, uh, equitable access in this pandemic and the next pandemic? Or do you think the governments are still believing that uh, patent rights, IP rights are you know, uh, acting a, at least a little bit as a barrier? Well. I, I would say that uh, that above uh, IP system, uh, there is the the, the 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 polarization and the movements in the political direction that Latin America is experiencing. We are moving from uh, uh, right or center government to extreme left. So uh, first thing to to get aware is this: you, 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 we can be discussing whatever we want uh, about IP and all the benefits uh, it has brought. Uh, uh, for 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 innovation and healthcare. However, if we we move or, or take a move like those that we have seen recently in Latin America, for example, like in Venezuela, to put put an example, uh, recently uh, uh, Peru or Chile, yeah, then you say you 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 get in another context in which the uh, general. Uh, um, regulatory uh, uh, stability is put in peril, including, of course, uh, the patent system. So right now in my country, we have uh, we are just uh, one month uh, to the presidential elections, and we have two completely different lines. One and and both of them competing uh, 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 head to head. Yeah. So one we have one candidate that clearly would move to a completely uh, understand, different understanding of the regulatory uh, regulation and the, let's say, property rights, uh, uh, property, let's say, of the uh, uh, role of the private industry in everything, yeah? And then we have, let's say, uh, 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 another candidate that would continue more in the kind of mind frame that we as a country have kept in the region, which is a relatively uh, stable uh, uh, country that tried to commit uh, as better as uh, scan to uh, general global agreements, uh, uh, for example, in the case of IP. But okay. uh, Latin America is is having this huge uh, directional change uh, that are, let's say, above anything we 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 talk in, 
yeah, this, uh, uh, from your comments and from Jashiri's comments, as well at the global WTO level, that there is politics involved here uh, that is perhaps entirely separate from the actual substantive issue of uh, the importance of IP rights. Uh, it's the political world we live in, uh, but it is an important point to note. Um, let me turn to, uh, in the interest of time, because I know we're running low on time, let me turn to, uh, to Chris, who is uh, coming to us from South Africa. South Africa, of course, uh, Chris is one of the original proponents of the waiver about uh, 18 months ago. Uh, South Africa and India came together to propose the waiver at the, of TRIPS provisions at the WTO. Uh, but uh, here we are now, a year and a half later, um, the pandemic has taken um, a whole host of different turns. So let me just start by asking you, in your view, is a waiver even needed anymore? Is, is the discussion even relevant anymore given the state of the pandemic and the uh, distribution of vaccines and other technologies around the world? Uh, thank you very much, Andre, and to the fellow panelists. It's an honor to be in such esteemed company. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, to CSIS and ITIF and Stephen Azal, especially, it's a great opportunity for us to get to participate here. Um, I mean, the best example to answer your question, Andre, would be to focus on a statement recently put out by um, the, the Africa Centers for Disease Control. And Aspen Pharmacare, which has an agreement with Johnson & Johnson about manufacturing and putting out their COVID vaccine in Africa, uh, Aspen informed the Africa Centers for Disease Control that it's concerned about a lack of requests for COVID-19 vaccines and it might close its manufacturing line if nothing changes. And that, that particular um, factory and upscaling is happening in South Africa itself. So all that capital investment, all that pushing, for for those agreements in terms of IP might now you know sort of fall fall away because of a range of reasons we have offline just as one example in terms of structural issues talked about rolling blackouts in South Africa I mean reliable electricity that might be a big issue with just getting electricity uh, getting vaccines manufactured in South South Africa and getting them out to people in the country never mind being concerned with things like you know on a meta level IP rights and patents and that sort of thing very what we like to call low-hanging fruit reforms that could be made for lots of African countries where you just focus on getting the basics right. But if you get those things right, then you have the the, the sort of broader environment going for innovation and, and uh, technological advancement. I will also mention um, that many African governments, in my view, might have found the, the sort of push for a waiver as an appealing way to divert away from maybe some of their own shortcomings and issues with negotiations. I can't, of course, speak on behalf of, of every government. I can't even speak on behalf of the South African government, unfortunately. But I would, I would venture that that is a possible explanation for why there has been this strong push from South Africa, especially for the waiver, because it helps to ensure that we don't focus on, again, those low-hanging fruit reforms and policy changes that could be made. Um, and just as a final point, I, I want to be cognizant, of course, of, of everyone's time. But Professor Furusa from the, he's the Vice Chancellor at uh, Africa, Africa University in Zimbabwe. He's pointed out that the African economy is losing billions of dollars for not protecting their intellectual property and young investors should be the most concerned. So it's up to African governments, African policymakers to focus on strengthening IP, getting those basic conditions and ingredients for economic growth and innovation right. And then I think you'll get more innovation, more capital formation and investment, and you won't have to worry about these things like undermining or diluting maybe in some ways the global uh, sphere of, of patents and innovation. In that way, you make sure that you keep the best minds and you keep the innovation going in Africa itself. Is there uh, any recognition at all in, at the government level in South Africa that uh, perhaps despite whatever conditions were relevant in, a year and a half or two years ago, uh, that caused South Africa to propose a waiver, that simply time has changed and um, the conditions on the ground have changed. 
and uh, understanding that, as Jayashree said, that so much effort has been put in and maybe something needs to be done politically, but perhaps maybe not because, again, the facts on the ground have changed. Any recognition at all um, that you've seen? I do think so, and my reason for that is tying it to the government's general stance on the pandemic in terms of uh, shifting away from thinking everything can be contained to how the, how do you get immunity up, be that through natural, be it through vaccines, be it through a combination of both. There's a bit more of an agility in that way, whereas beforehand it was very much um, sort of centrally managed and, and trying to to keep cases to an absolute minimum, of almost zero COVID sort of sort of idea moving around. And that has changed significantly. And that's largely, I think, because the government has recognized that both the private sector and international companies are doing what they can to get vaccines out there. So there's a lot of agreement, there's a lot of sharing, there's a lot of um, uh, work on the ground by non-government organizations, non-profit organizations to ensure that the commun communication strategy is is foremost. I mean, Jayashree, she mentioned vaccine hesitancy. I think for a lot of of Africans, especially, that's a big issue. And how do you how do you communicate those messages? It's not a simple case of saying we've got unlimited supply, therefore people will take it. You have to convince them of the benefits thereof, and in their in in terms and and ways that could resonate with their values. Um, so I do think the government is shifting in that they might also. I mean, the biggest issue here, I will say, and the caveat is. They expended a lot of political capital on pushing for the waiver. So how do you give them a bit of an off ramp or a bit of a sort of face saving, quote unquote, sort of idea in terms of, yes, we pushed for this and, you know, we were going to get it. But maybe, you know, we don't need it anymore. How do we make sure that the ultimate goal is just higher vaccine uptake kind of thing? So how do we how do we help them in that way, get off that sort of road and into a more practical, uh, attainable route, I think? So that's a very good uh, uh, segue, uh, and we need to wrap up given the time. But um, I do want to uh, go around the panel and uh, and and ask a follow-up question. Uh, what I hear from almost everyone on this panel is that there are political pressures here that go well beyond intellectual property, well beyond the specific uh, substantive issues of trips and compulsory licensing and the like, um, and folks need to, I mean, they have political investment, political capital, and so on. What can the various organizations do? And I'll start with Marco from WIPO's perspective. What could WIPO do, for example, um, to educate the governments of the world, the member states, the decision makers, about the role of IP so that um, so, so that decisions are made locally based on facts and based on uh, fulsome information. Um, is there more that, in an education point of view that uh, they can take place, Marco? Many, many things, Andre. And, and yes, indeed, we can do we can do more, and we should do more. Um, we are doing a lot, anyhow. Um, we are producing a number of reports, let me just mention a few that I quoted today, the Global Innovation Index report that shows what is going on in innovation worldwide, the uh, World Intellectual uh, Property Report, the uh, Patent Landscape Report, and the Technology Trend Report. All those reports that happen once a year uh, contain um, an, an enormous amount of uh, data that should be helpful for governments to take informed decisions. In parallel, we have all the traditional wipe assistance in providing technical advice in, um, in legislation, in policy design at the national level. And we have the WIPO Academy working intensively in different programs, more than 1,000, more than 150,000 people trained in one single year worldwide um, and building capacity all, 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 all over the world. So we are doing without any doubt a lot, but we need to be aware that there are occasions in, in which there are simply different views about the role of, um, of IP. And, and when we have those, we need to be respectful when they are well-funded. But in many occasions, 
the difficulty is uh, some of the difference may be lack of knowledge, lack of expertise. We know how difficult is policy on IP. Uh, we know that in many in, in many jurisdictions of the world that I there are IP expert, people that knows very well the legislation, but IP policy goes beyond. You, you require a different vision and, and a different level of knowledge and expertise to be able to put in place policy. So it's, it's a huge challenge. And in my view, this is something that should call our attention because in my view, in many occasions, the proposals are not the best suitable ones because the questions that have been asked are the wrong ones. And in many occasions, if you ask the wrong question, you cannot come with the, with the right solution. And, and, and that is what is happening in, in, in many occasions in solutions that have been put forward that are probably not the one that can meet the real needs of a number of people. Now, when we focus on issues that are true, I mean, scaling up, transferring technology, producing locally to increase access to the technology. In my view, all those issues are right, even if we are facing some challenges, because after some of those contracts and capacity have been stalled for the local production, something is not working. Well, we need to find out what is not working, and we need to work on that. Uh, because in my view, those, those issues were the real concrete issue that needs to be addressed and have been addressed in a very positive manner. We need to keep working on that. And th there is a lot of room for more work. Thanks, Marco. I should mention for the audience that Marco has been at WIPO for probably more than 20 years now. But before then, he was the head of the Colombian IP office. Um, so uh, uh, has, you have a whole global perspective here. Um, uh, so Carlos uh, from Colombia, uh, from sitting in Colombia, um, Last word here uh, in just a minute or so uh, from you. Uh, what more can be done to make sure that developing go uh, governments in developing countries uh, at least have all the facts uh, at, at hand and that they know at the minimum that there's already flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement uh, and the like? Yep, absolutely. Um, uh, I would say that uh, de definitely we we need to to support education and uh, in innovation in healthcare and the role of uh, IP for this innovation. So so I think that uh, approaches like uh, this week uh, approach from uh, YPU, uh, Marco is leading uh, relating uh, IP week uh, with uh, JAUTH, for example, is very important. Yeah, we are going to do tomorrow. Uh, also here, uh, 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 let's say, uh, an event uh, pushing uh, young people uh, here in interest and involved in, in uh, innovation in healthcare to move on and to let them understand how important it is. But I think that we we can work for many more people, for for uh, already people working in, in, in hospitals, people developing in, in the different uh, elements of the sector, uh, and uh, and uh, educate, educate, and educate. I, I definitely, I think that's the issue. But but I would say in trying to reshift the conversation, probably not putting IP because uh, uh, many people get get a scare when they hear from the healthcare when they hear the the word IP. They say no, that that is an issue of the lawyers, of the university, of the lawyers, of the hospital, of the uh, research center. So no, no, no. Let's try to focus in big goals. We need, we have problems with certain uh, illness. Let's say if we want to challenge this as a mission, yeah, and we want uh, results in uh, nutrition, in mortality, blah, 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 in, in any kind of healthcare challenge, we need intersectoral action, we, and we need uh, research, innovation, and then IP comes. IP comes as the, let's say, the rules of the game on how we can work together easy in an harmonious way to produce the results that we are to have and then i think that it makes more sense to everybody uh, to be part of the conversation on how we accelerate and make more dynamic uh, 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 innovation in our healthcare system and 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 i would uh, just uh, want to recap with with a comment that jeshuri uh, mentioned and is um uh, i think the 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 voluntary 
uh, actions for many actors dur dur during the pandemic has been very important. And I would say that IP is working perfectly for what we should want it, and is to have solutions quick, good solutions to solve huge, big problems like this we have in the pandemic. So let the production and let the financing of the issue not on the IP system, but in other in in other companies. But if you want to make the people good and compassionate and make voluntary through the IP system, we are getting run. Yeah, IP is to be effective and successful producing solutions fast by the uh, uh, science, technology, and innovation ecosystem, and that's it. Yeah, and the rest we should take her in other dimensions. Uh, and and I mean we need to be be civilized. Uh, voluntary action, acts of kindness that we have had from industry, from, from governments, from country to country, et cetera, and try to move, move do, those acts and to dynamite those acts, but not try, we cannot legislate compassion and, and, and put it in, 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 in the acts. That's a mistake. Right. Thank you, uh, Carlos and Jashri. The last words for our panel, uh, I'll give them to you. Uh, you already uh, suggested some way to save face, perhaps uh, recognizing the realities on the ground that so much political capital has been invested here. What do you think is the most pragmatic way to bring this issue to a close vis-a-vis uh, -vis the TRIPS waiver so that the governments of the world can really get together to focus on the you know, really effective ways of being compassionate, as Carlos says, ensuring equitable distribution for the rest of this pandemic, but also importantly for the other future crises in the world with some practical moving forward ways. Last words. Yes. Um, I, you know, Andre, as, as I spoke about it last April also, I think there needs to be a fund, a financial mechanism to, to kind of uh, to, 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 to help countries to contain the pandemic, uh, and and that is something that now is widely agreed to. That in fact the United States administration, the current administration, is also backing a, a financial intermediary fund. Um, so, so the thing is, people are thinking small. I think uh, you know, given the trillions of dollars of economic uh, losses globally, uh, I think we should be thinking in terms of investing hundreds of billions of dollars, not tens of billions of dollars. So we should be really thinking big. Uh, but unfortunately, for the world uh, today, because, not because of COVID, but because of so many other reasons, multilateralism is coming to an end. I mean, you know, uh, just when we need it the most, just when we need multilateral institutions to deliver global public goods, we are seeing them wither away. Uh, so I would end by saying multilateralism is failing, but multilateralism needs to succeed. Well, uh, on those uh, wise words, thank you uh, very much to all the panelists. Really a fabulous conversation. Uh, thank you for the audience. And I hope uh, decision makers around the world uh, pay attention to uh, what all of you have to say um, as true experts and uh, lots of experience in different capacities from around the world. Um, thank you for, your, uh, for being here and for giving us your time. Thank you to CSIS and to ITIF for uh, organizing this and allowing us to be on your platforms. Bye now.
Well, thank you to Andre and our partners at CISAS for co-hosting this important forum today on innovation and IP's role in combating the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Stephen Ezel, the Vice President of Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Well, as we talked about in the previous forum, the rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics was virtually unprecedented in human history. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, for instance, So, for instance, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine arrived just 347 days after the virus was first detected. Likewise, Gilead Sciences' COVID-19 therapeutic remdesivir received emergency use approval from the FDA a mere 123 days after the virus's detection. By comparison, a 2017 GlaxoSmithKline study had observed that, quote, it can take up to $1 billion and 20 to 50 years to create and fully distribute a vaccine at scale. In this case, however, we had 12 billion COVID-19 vaccines produced by year in 2021 and are on track to produce 24 billion by the middle of 2022. Overall, there have been 238 COVID-19 vaccines under development. However, of the two uh, of the 58 that have entered clinical trials in the United States, only two have received full FDA approval, a success rate of 3.4%, showing just how difficult developing COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics, just as developing any other drug has been. But how has the U.S. and global life sciences community been able to produce and distribute COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics so rapidly? And what does this portend for future drug discovery and development efforts? That's our topic today, which we'll explore on an all-star panel that I'll introduce now. They'll provide about eight to 10 minutes of presentation remarks, and then we'll look forward to taking your questions in our remaining time, which you can submit via the CIS webpage Ask Live Questions button. But first today, we're honored to have with us Simon Tripp. Simon is Principal and Senior Director at Techonomy Partners, an economic development and research consulting firm. He'll show findings from his report, Response and Resilience, Lessons Learned from Global Life Sciences Ecosystems During the COVID-19 pandemic, Pandemic. Uh, before joining Techonomy, Simon served as Senior Director at the Battelle Technology Partnership Practice, and he holds a Master's in Geography from West Virginia University. Next, we're honored to have with us Jennifer Brandt. Jennifer is director of the Geneva-based Innovation Council. She'll share findings from her excellent report, co-authored with Mark Schultz, titled Unprecedented, the Rapid Innovation Response to COVID-19 and the Role of Intellectual Property. Jennifer has more than 20 years experience providing public policy research and analysis in fields ranging from international trade and economics to IP law. She holds MAs from SAIS and an MA in International Law from the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva. Next, we're honored to have with us Dr. Monique Mansura, who is the Executive Director of Global Health Security and Biotechnology at the Mitre Corporation. She will share insights about how the COVID-19 pandemic has helped shape her recent work on reports such as building a sustainable biopharma industrial base and building a sustainable biopreparedness industrial base. Monique has been involved in several notable global health efforts, including the Human Genome Project. She holds a PhD in bioengineering and an MS in human genetics from the University of Michigan. Last but not least, honored to have with us today David Adler, who was Senior Advisor for Economics at XA Investments, but he's a renowned economics author who's a regular contributor to the Financial Times and the American Affairs Journal, where he has an excellent piece called Inside Operation Warp Speed, a new model for industrial policy, which he'll speak about today and talk about the important role of public-private partnerships in developing and distributing COVID-19 vaccines. David's also quoted several important anthologies, uh, which I highly recommend you read, including The Productivity Puzzle and Understanding American Economic Decline. David holds a master's degree in economics from Columbia University. All right, with that, let me turn the conversation over to our panelists, uh, starting with Simon. Uh, and uh, we appreciate you joining us today, uh, both on the panel and in the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for providing the opportunity to discuss the findings of our research. Uh, our project Response and Resilience was sponsored by Pfizer. We conducted it 
uh, right in the heart of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, actually authored it right before the vaccines, the first vaccine was released. Um, COVID-19 has been and continues to be obviously an extremely challenging disease. It's created a fast-moving global pandemic and it activated the life sciences community worldwide to develop rapid and accurate diagnostics, therapeutics, and of course, vaccines. The global nature of the challenge provided us with a unique opportunity to examine the responsiveness of existing life sciences ecosystems collectively and individually across the globe and to reflect on what's worked well and what has not worked well in the fight against the pandemic. Uh, the project examined the response within ecosystems worldwide and we undertook specific case studies of 13 nations known for having uh, pretty robust R&D and production ecosystems in human life sciences. The analysis provides a series of lessons learned that form the basis of a report that may help national leaders and their life science ecosystems best position themselves uh, for when the next pandemic uh, or public health challenge occurs. Uh, we began the evaluation process by determining a typical life sciences ecosystem structure. And, you know, it obviously looks quite complex here on this slide because it is. Um, this served as the organizing backbone for our subsequent analysis. Uh, we started by considering the core value chain that innovates, tests, produces and distributes life sciences products. Then we considered the structural elements of the markets in which the delivery of life sciences products occurs. We also accounted for the major cross-cutting elements of the ecosystem that support and enable its operation. So we had to look at talent, at financial capital, at public policies and regulations. Um, and certainly that last area of policies and regulations was a, was a target rich environment uh, with the pandemic providing a real proving ground uh, for the interface between governments and industry. We then began the process of examining what has happened in each of the, the global life sciences ecosystems we were looking at. And as we accumulated knowledge, uh, we classified the lessons learned into their appropriate ecosystem element. And we use that as an organizing principle for the report. Uh, I'm just gonna step us quickly through uh, each of the lessons learned at a relatively high level. Um, First, in terms of R&D, uh, a key finding is certainly how diverse the source of innovations has been. Uh, industry, of course, comes into play in this space for many innovations and for pretty much all of them when it comes to production and distribution. Collaborations have also been very important. The collaborations between universities and industry, nonprofits and industry, and between multiple companies, uh, including competitors, uh, has been very much in evidence. The vaccines that moved most rapidly into major trials were largely the results of collaborations, uh, and we have a graphic illustrating that point in the report. Um, I don't believe this third bullet point has been well enough recognized that those in R&D have performed their work in the midst of a pandemic that impacted their working environments. So there's certainly a lesson learned there and the importance of prioritizing PPE and other critical resources to those engaged in research because they are essential workers. Another key finding was that the big iron in science, you know, largely supported with public dollars, uh, uh, really paid off in terms of being deployed against the coronavirus. The, the massive synchrotrons, such as the Diamond Light Source in the UK, uh, the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 in the US, uh, provided the ability to image the virus and associated biological processes in, in really high resolution. And national supercomputing resources around the world were highly leveraged uh, in, in the fight. Um, those are resources that are simply too expensive for, for businesses to develop themselves, and it's important that national governments support those uh, resources. Um, the final bullet on here I think is very important to relay, and that is that when uh, politicians or special interests question the cost of, of government investment in research grants and instrumentation funding, we've certainly now got uh, ample evidence to show the far greater cost of inaction. In terms of lessons learned on clinical trials, well, it, it's evident that quick facilitation and adoption of contactless and virtual trial support activities were an important element in sustaining trials and starting new trials. Uh, patient consults were able to be provided via telemedicine and medications were able to be provided via contactless pathways. Uh, some regulatory processes could have significantly slowed advancement of COVID fighting products, but we've seen regulatory agencies in the US and in Europe and other locations being surprisingly flexible and responsive in providing timely guidance, quick approval for trials and emergency youth authorizations. And speed of action was obviously critical. Processes in trials 
uh, as Stephen mentioned, that have usually required many months to oper operationalize and many years to, to bring to fruition, have, have pr proved accomplishable in, in weeks. In terms of production, uh, innovation in the pandemic hasn't just come from big pharma companies, it's, it's come from a diversity of quite large and small ventures. However, it's very apparent that big pharma has the production expertise and the horsepower needed to advance critical products over the finish line and into production. So companies have been laudably willing to collaborate with each other to provide manufacturing capacity and expertise. In terms of supply chain, we certainly saw uh, observable challenges, although I think it's fair to say that the challenges experienced were not as bad as many depicted. Uh, ports of in entry certainly slowed down, air transport slowed, uh, and, and transportation in the cargo holds of passenger flights. And some countries did move to interfere in exports of products, but overall the supply chain was surprisingly resilient uh, for biopharmaceutical products, less so for PPE. Um, the need for speed has illustrated a need for government regulators to be responsive in approving advanced production technologies in areas like continuous manufacturing, single-use systems, and modular manufacturing. On the distribution side, uh, in terms of supply chains and distribution, uh, the pandemic has raised importance of risk mitigation and resiliency in supply chains and perhaps reduced the emphasis on pure cost efficiency. Um, having a contingency plan and emergency inventory where feasible certainly makes sense and it's important to communicate to governments the importance of not interrupting international supply chains. Now, what we found is that nationalism really doesn't work in a global pandemic when it's in the interests of a connected world and a global economy to get the pandemic under control everywhere. Um, the final bullet has a large role to play in terms of building resiliency into the system. Uh, wider technology investment and adoption here uh, can provide real-time supply monitoring, allowing reach back to supplier systems and generally build a more resilient supply chain and distribution system. Talent. Well, life sciences are obviously driven by skilled human capital, and it obviously takes considerable time to educate and train the workforce that power life sciences and ecosystems. Um, protecting that talent that you have is absolutely critical because obviously you cannot get more in real time in the midst of a pandemic. Um, the last bullet here I think is particularly important to note as we talk about digital supply chains and new technologies, and that's that almost all major industries are in competition for advanced computation and digital analytics talent. And so building a talent base with both life sciences and digital analytics skills is highly important and may require some new uh, cross-training models. In terms of capital, um, there's lots of examples in the report in the first bullet of government stepping up to the plate with COVID specific funding. Um, on the second bullet, uh, we certainly see multiple examples of government providing funding to help build manufacturing uh, capacity and that co-investment has been important in helping companies mitigate risk in developing production capacity in advance of having a proven product. Uh, Big Pharma uh, had the financial and intellectual capital resources to make partnerships work and a willingness to put those uh, resources to work. I, I think, you know, pharma companies did not entrench and hoard cash in the economic downturn that occurred. Rather, they stepped up and invested at risk, and that deserves wide recognition. Uh, we certainly saw the stock prices for many companies with promising products take off, and there's a lesson learned there, I think, in terms of the fact that companies that own a significant amount of their own stock might get a quick cash infusion from public markets. Uh, and those countries with uh, robust risk capital markets, uh, with venture capital, also been those li most likely to drive forward innovations towards commercialization on the pandemic. Policies and regulations. I, I guess the first bullet speaks to the well-known medical ethics rule of first do no harm. It's important to communicate that attention needs to be paid to assuring that pan uh, pandemic responses aren't in a, are conducted in a panicked or a knee-jerk policy way and don't cause harm to the very life sciences ecosystems that are trying to provide solutions. Uh, we certainly saw that pre-planned responses and emergency contingency plans generally work well at a national level. Uh, Korea and Taiwan, for example, executed existing plans very well. Uh, unfortunately, the US chose to ignore an existing uh, playbook and, and, and that uh, certainly impacted the, the challenges here. 
Uh, the liability issue is one that shouldn't be ignored. Issues here are not only in terms of product liability, when pressure's there in a pandemic to rapidly speed up product development and launch, but also perhaps liability for future shareholder litigation when manufacturers built manufacturing capacity at risk in advance of having a product and therefore had a risk of a stranded asset. Uh, and, and also the disinformation and misinformation uh, issue is huge. So social media exacerbated the challenge and that needs to be addressed. We've seen that misinformation and deliberate disinformation can spread rapidly and impact the effectiveness of even the most prestigious organizations such as the CDC through politicization. We should not ignore the fact that a significant number of actors chose to do the wrong thing and endanger public health and that needs to be factored into future planning. In terms of customers and markets, it's fair to say that we've seen the public health crisis of this magnitude can bulldoze barriers to new tech uh, out of the way and challenge old ways of doing things. Um, that's become clear in uh, rapid adoption, adoption of virtual and contactless systems in healthcare, for example. Uh, we can also see that providing universal public access to diagnostics and care is not just the right thing to do, it's the economically smart thing to do. Um, the pandemic will create market growth in, in certain areas. We expect to see government funding, obviously, for infectious diseases research to increase. Uh, we also note that the long-term impact of coronaviruses on patient health and chronic conditions needs further research. Uh, it, it's a weird disease and a, a huge amount is not yet known about it. Um, the lessons learned lead to five core conclusions. Um, those are in our report and given time constraints here, I'm not going to go into those, but also our full slides, which do contain those five lessons learned, uh, are being uploaded by ITIF and will be available on the website. So uh, thank you, Stephen. I'll uh, try and figure out how to stop sharing here. Uh, have I stopped sharing? Ah, you have. You Thank have. you, Simon. Okay. We'll now turn it over to Jen Brandt. That was great, Simon. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I have some slides as well. Okay. Can you see my slides? Sorry, just checking if you can see the slides. Not um, yet. Okay. Can you see them now? Still not yet? Are they are they visible? If so, I'll get started. Can I begin? Go ahead, Jen, although we still don't see the slides. Ah, oh, shoot. Okay. Let me try one more time. Hold on. Um, I apologize for that. I'll try one more time. Um, okay. Um, there we go. Is that better now? Oh, now it seems like we're getting there. Okay, great. There Sorry about that. Okay. Hey, out of this COVID-19 pandemic, we've got innovation in biotechnology and information technology. That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, I'm very sorry about the delay. Um, so, okay, my name is Jennifer Brandt, and I have recently co-authored a report that I'll present today with Professor Mark Schultz, as Steve mentioned in the introduction. Okay, so this is the research project that we launched in 2021. Um, we worked from May to August 1st. We cut off our research at August 1st just because we had to pick a cutoff point, and things were just really evolving so rapidly that we stopped there. Um, we looked at the innovation response to the COVID pandemic, and in particular, the role of intellectual property in the response. Um, we relied on these sources that were described, and we were really lucky to be able to interview um, more than a dozen senior executives from the companies that led the innovation response. So that was really interesting. We got a lot of behind the scenes stories and anecdotes that um, really brought some life to the story of how we got these vaccines so rapidly and therapeutics. Um, our report is called Unprecedented for reasons I think that by now are obvious to everyone, and Steve even said in his introduction. So our findings were that first and foremost, collaboration was very important for the COVID innovation response. Um, there was a lot of technology and knowledge sharing, especially during the manufacturing phase. 
and IP was an enabler at all stages of the response. Okay, um, I think it's important to underline the context for this research project. I feel like as time goes on, we forget that the pandemic was a highly unusual situation for innovators. It's very rare that you have a health problem affecting everybody in the world all at one time. And R&D systems and manufacturing networks are just simply not set up for that. So um, it was a very unusual and difficult situation. And there was not idle capacity for manufacturing sitting around, right, once the vaccines were developed. I think this is a, a very important point to make, and it's one that I'll repeat again later. Um, this was a very difficult environment for innovators. Uh, this was alluded to by Simon as well. Um, I live in Switzerland, and one example is that when they closed the borders at the start of the pandemic, all of the essential health workers that usually flow across the border from France and Germany to staff the production sites for the life sciences industry in Switzerland could suddenly not get to work. Um, that was a problem. We also saw incredible supply chain pressures. Um, these supply chains for inputs and equipment for biomanufacturing were already somewhat strained at the start of the pandemic. And we saw things like filters for bioreactors, which you have to change with each production run, go from a four to six week delivery period to a estimated 60 to 65 week delivery date. And that caused behaviors such as buying more than you would realistically need because you didn't know when next you could get your hands on them. Um, so more pressure on supply chains. We saw export controls, um, counterproductive policies like that. So I just wanna underline, this was an incredibly diff difficult environment um, to navigate. We had novel products, as everyone's aware, um, the mRNA vaccine, for example, had never been commercialized. Um, that had its own challenges. And distribution is something that was flagged um, early in our research in May. Um, one of the companies we consulted as part of our research mentioned that they had had a number of engagements in uh, West Africa. And in particular, in one country, they were kept trying to get material um, and that needed to be in a cold chain, uh, an ultra cold chain. And every time the plane would touch down on the ground, there would be some problem and they'd have to try again, try again. So it would take several tries to get the material to their research partner on the ground. Um, this was quite interesting to hear about at that time because we weren't yet completely aware of the distribution challenges that we would face and the resulting vaccine inequities. Um, we focus on the industry response. We don't focus so much on government policies and support, but I just wanted to note, obviously, government support and action was incredibly important. And then we had the unprecedented, uh, unprecedented outcome. Um, the fastest vaccine development before COVID was four years of the MMR vaccine from lab to, to market. And this was a period of, let's say, nine months from when work started in earnest. So it was truly unprecedented in that way. And also the collaborations that emerged, um, including among competitors, were quite unusual. So we studied the role of IP in relation to these four categories, and that's also how our report is structured. So we looked at the pre-existing IP and know-how, uh, technologies and know-how. We looked at the collaboration that took place in order to develop the new COVID solutions. We looked at the role of IP along the entire process, um, the risks, the costs um, undertaken, especially by industry actors, who are really the protagonists of the story we tell. And then we looked at the establishment of these global network, globally distributed manufacturing networks, which is a really important part of this story. And so because we had a, um, a person on our research team who's an opera singer, um, we described the story as an industrial drama in three acts. So he was responsible for that. So act one, um, this is the part of the report where we looked at the pre-existing technologies and knowledge um, and the relationships that already existed among the companies. Um, that's also important to flag just because of the trust that existed and the ability also of certain actors, notably Pfizer and BioNTech, to pivot their existing project and focus on COVID. Um, my co-author Mark loves to, cause, uh, to call the vaccines overnight successes that were decades in the making. Um, you know, J&J &J had been working for 15 years on their viral vector platform. It had been used for Ebola, um, but they were able to, to recruit it in the fight against COVID. BioNTech, 25 years of research on the mRNA platform, but they had never successfully, successfully commercialized anything at the time of the pandemic. Um, Moderna, Novavax, we can continue. Um, there was a lot that was ripe and ready to go, which is, you know, in the right place at the right time, very lucky. Um, but the point is that there were in incredibly significant investments, a lot of time and energy that went into developing the background technologies and know-how that were rapidly leveraged. Another important element was handoff. 
um, universities and research centers did play an important role in the development of these background technologies. Um, and these were transferred to the private sector companies to take forward using IP rights, of course. Okay, act two. Act two was the part of the pandemic response that involved substantial collaboration and the development of these new vaccines, as well as the development of the processes to manufacture them. So here's where it was really interesting to speak with the people from the companies involved. Um, we heard about agreements being put in place incredibly quickly, and then the details worked out later, right? Like the napkin agreement, and then so work could get started and the details, you know, um, specified at a later time. We asked a lot of people, how is it that you were able to work with your competitors? Like, didn't that seem strange? And most people said, no, it made perfect sense. The big companies that are normally our competitors were the ones with the best capacity, the best equipment, um, the most knowledge and experience. So it made perfect sense to work together because we knew that we were the ones who could take this furthest the fastest. A lot of companies told us about how they moved resources. Um, so one company said they put 100 people from other sites onto one manufacturing site in the first three months. Um, they started 24 hour production lines, seven days a week. Um, another company told us that they already had a synthetic lipid R&D program in place, but they moved resources quickly onto that and they accelerated delivery of the resulting product to market in only nine, by nine months, so nine months faster. And that contributed ultimately to the production of lipid nanoparticles for the mRNA vaccine. Um, moving resources included a lot of cost and risk so opportunity cost for the other areas of healthcare where the manufacturing was no longer taking place in the R&D, and also risk because you're moving, you know, all of your resources for a for a, um, an R&D program on COVID, manufacturing on COVID that may not succeed. There is rapid progress. Um, most people involved in manufacturing told us it takes 18 to 24 months to bring production of something new online at the, at its best with substantial effort and financing. Here they were aiming for four to six months. And we talked at length with uh, Novartis, for example, with the person in charge of manufacturing. And they worked closely with Pfizer and BioNTech to develop a manufacturing process to make the mRNA platform at scale. And they did that in four months, working around the clock um, with their best people. It was really quite unprecedented. There was some repurposing. And here we spoke about, we spoke with the people from the companies about different collaborations with universities where there was maybe a monoclonal antibody library that was rapidly reviewed um, to see what could be repurposed um, and used potentially for COVID. And all of the partners really brought different things. So experience and skilled personnel, um, the experience to, to see problems in the production line um, with these very novel manufacturing processes and be able to figure out what's going on and solve it, um, for example. Um, process optimization services, supply chain management, regulatory expertise. So each partner brought something different. There are a lot of new ways of doing things that we uncovered, um, talking to people from the companies and doing our research. One really important one that I think will be here to stay is the compressing of the timeline for developing uh, manufacturing processes at scale. And a new way of doing that where you do that alongside the clinical trials and seeking regulatory approval rather than sequencing it, which is the classic way of doing that, where you make a little bit for each you know, stage of clinical trials, just what you know, and then you scale, what you need, excuse me, and you scale at the end. Here, they were scaling alongside clinical trials and regulatory approval. Regulatory engagement was just mentioned by Simon. Um, we heard a lot about um, a very close relationship and engagement with regulators in key jurisdictions um, to see how they could compress the timeline for approval without sacrificing, of course, quality and patient safety. And then of course, government funding to offset things like the cost of clinical trials, um, assessing manufacturing facilities, that was really important. Okay, act three. Oh, these are quotes um, that I found really interesting from some of the interviews. And they focus on things like the cost of shifting equipment and people from pre-existing research projects to COVID, et cetera. Okay, um, so act three was about scaling manufacturing. And here the government helped in some cases to pay for an assessment of existing manufacturing capacity, but then it would be up to the company to upgrade the, the manufacturing infrastructure. Um, and this is a cost, right? It's a risk. And anyway, once that had done, the companies looked at their in-house capacity and realized that it was just not going to cut it. This was a crisis on a scale that required a lot of manufacturing partners. Um, one company said, we looked at our in-house capacity and we could have made 500,000 doses of our vaccine. 
So all of the leading vaccine manufacturers or developers started looking for partners. And again, there was not a lot of idle capacity around and they needed very specific types of partners with the facilities, the staff, the experience, the capacity to make, um, they make these very sensitive and complex products at the quality and safety required. There's a nice story that we came across um, from the Wall Street Journal mid 2021 that tells the story um, of how one person from Pfizer goes around the globe talking to different potential partners. And technology transfer was essential to bringing these producers online. Um, and so working side by side very closely with these partners, technology knowledge was being shared voluntarily. Um, and I think this is a really important thing to recognize. And this is a story that's told in more detail in the report because what we have heard are um, arguments that technology is being hoarded, nobody's sharing know-how and trade secrets, but actually we're observing the opposite. Um, from our research. And over time, at the time we did our research, um, we found 46 publicly announced uh, research club or tech transfer collaborations for manufacturing. And this was looking, you know, company by company at different press releases because there wasn't yet, you know, Airfinity data published regularly. Today, the data shows that there's 360 such collaborations. So there's really been an incredible growth um, in a lot of technology and knowledge being shared. Okay, so here's what we learned, just to summarize a little bit what I just discussed. Collaboration um, was our, this is our top message. Collaboration was crucial to go so far so fast. Um, people had to work together. Uh, know how and experience, um, especially when developing novel manufacturing processes and optimizing them was really important. And this was brought to the table by many different players. Uh, technology was shared rapidly, even among competitors, um, including on you know back of the napkin agreements basis and the scale of the crisis required these partnerships that I just mentioned and the tech transfer to make them work. So we've got some new approaches to commercialization, like I mentioned, um, including compressing the timeline for manufacturing and regulatory approval. And then the positive role of IP along the way is something that's underlined repeatedly in our report. In terms of the takeaways for policymakers, um, I guess the, the, the main one is this crucial role of collaboration, which is why it's an orange. Um, we heard from companies that it was it was really important for them to immediately come forward and help to address the pandemic, including with partners. They wanted to put all of their best knowledge and technology on the table to share and, and work together, but that's incredibly risky. So without a song, solid IP position, they were risking losing the fruit of years of investment and work. Um, and they were fearful that the company in that context would not exist on the other side of the pandemic. So that. IP position, the IP protection, and being able to share safely with other partners was a very important element of the successful innovation response to COVID. Um, and this is the, the main message that we hope policymakers will take from this report. Um, I mean, innovation and rapid scaling and manufacturing turned out not to be enough, sadly. I mean, the vaccine inequities that we've seen are unacceptable, and we've heard from people in the first panel how to deal with that. And then also some of the government policy responses were not always helpful, as was alluded to by Simon, um, you know, notably things like export controls. But I don't want to be unkind. Um, I think we'll leave it at that and just say there's work to be done. Things like regulatory harmonization, vaccine dose sharing, um, things probably for another panel. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jen. That was fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, over to you, Dr. Mansoura. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Grateful for this opportunity. Um, pulling up slides now. We see them. Excellent. Fabulous. All right. Again, thank you for the opportunity. It's a fabulous panel. It's been a fabulous event, and thank you for allowing me to be part of it. Um, Stephen, you mentioned my science background, but I think the other important element that you'll see infused in the remarks I give and the, the research we've done is the business side of this as well. The science and technology, I think, as everybody acknowledges, um, the extraordinary accomplishment uh, of the vaccines in particular, but more broadly, the ecosystem and the medical countermeasures that have been developed to save, um, to save people around the world. Um, it's really important for us, and a lot of the work that we've done, um, you'll see just from the title, Sustaining a Bioindustrial Base, we do feel it's critical to view the um, this ecosystem of innovators in biotechnology um, as an industrial base and to apply that framework, again, to look at the science and technology, the regulatory, the policy, as well as the business and financing side. 
Um, and with that, we look at it with three lenses, national security, economic security and the bioeconomy, and of course, healthcare and saving lives. Um, so my background, again, is four dimensional. I, I've, I've studied this and lived in this space, both from an academic perspective, from an industrial perspective, from a government perspective, where I was part of standing up ASPR and BARDA soon after 9-11, um, as well as my current role in a nonprofit, where we do a lot of data-driven, independent, objective, evidence-based research. So um, I'll talk about um, U.S. industrial policy and where biopharma fits, and then the 10-point action plan that MITRE has developed, and the recent um, study of the mRNA platform through the lens of a great power competition. Uh, it's really important. I do want us to step back. I know we're very focused on COVID-19, but again, I've got a 20-year long view of medical countermeasures and the interface between governments and industry. And if you look at just some of these quotes from leaders in industry and government and um, commissions like the what is now the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, um, as well as uh, sort of media reports that have talked to Again, dozens, as I have, dozens of C-suite executives that have been at this interface. Um, it was sort of a troubled partnership, and, and I do use partnership in, in quotes. Um, there was a lot of evidence of uh, a rush uh, to request that medical countermeasures be developed, but as events like Ebola and Zika, even H7N9 influenza back in 2013, um, really have indicated that uh, we tend to lose focus as the epidemiology wanes. So the question I really ask now and that we have asked uh, at MITRE is, again, undoubtedly unprecedented, undoubtedly extraordinary, but the key questions for us is, is this event sustainable in capacity and capability, and is it reproducible? Um, again, we're looking at the long view of the future of the criticality of this infrastructure, ca capability, and capacity. So as we looked at, uh, again, here in a national security lens, when our Defense Department looks at uh, how strong its manufacturing base is for the defense industrial base and supply chain resilience, um, we looked at this report in 2018 and we asked the question, where is biopharma? Uh, again, I had come from the BARDA world uh, where medical countermeasures were critically important to addressing both intentional threats like chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, but also the, uh, the, the mother nature, the naturally occurring events like the Ebola, the Zika COVID-19 threats. Um, and again, we didn't see uh, a, a capability or a chapter, if you will, on biotechnology. Um, but when we looked at the risk ar archetypes, whether it's a single source or a fragile supplier or a fragile market, uh, foreign dependencies, again, which, which are a concern for national security, we saw all the same themes that we thought were critically important in our ability, again, here's a distinction, to prepare for, not only respond to uh, these threats. Um, I, I think, again, if we look at the mRNA technolo technology and what had been done in, in 2020 and to this day, um, we do need to look back at the seeds that were sown um, in, in fantastic programs. For example, the one that Dan Wattendorf ran as a DARPA program manager uh, in the 2012, 13, 14 timeframe. I was at Novartis at the time and working with world-class scientists like Andy Geel and 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 uh, and Jeff and uh, Jeff Hallmer, sorry. Um, and as we we were looking for the transition plan, we were looking for the Apollo program, right? This was a successful DARPA program, uh, and and there was clear policy that we wanted our nation to be ready for any threat, any time, known or unknown, um, with rapid manufacturing capability. And so I think it's really important to look back at what might have been done, what could have been done with this promising mRNA program that came out of DARPA almost a decade ago. So as we looked at the at the 10 point action plan, basically we looked at it through with three primary sort of mission statements. Uh, again, from a national security lens, the protection of your population is a fundamental principle um, and responsibility of government leaders. Um, that said, that doesn't mean uh, that we don't protect the rest of the world. That is inherent in these infectious disease threats that we have to take care of a global population because of the nature of these threats. Um, the other thing, again, is supply chain resilience. And we ask hard questions about policy. What does that mean? Uh, what is this discussion about we need to onshore more? And how consistent is that with how the industry um, sources and, and develops its supply chain? And then, of course, biotechnology. Again, there's a lot of pride in this country about the, uh, you know, the, the 
launching of biotechnology basically in the U.S., but what we see is the industrialization outside the U.S., the building of supply chains outside the U.S. And I think that, you know, it's not right or wrong. The question is, what is our policy and what are the capabilities and capacities we want to maintain? So as we try to synthesize, again, 20 years of experience and, and hundreds of pages of analytics, we wanted to keep it simple. And, and uh, the themes in the, in the buckets of policy, program, and finance identified basically 10 things that are absolutely in instrumental. And it starts with what are our strategic goals? So again, if the goal is to have the ability to protect 8 billion people within 100 days of uh, a novel threat, then we have to make sure that we make the investments, we have understandings for collaboration across the world, who's gonna do what, where. Um, so that's first and foremost, both at a national and global level. Portfolio strategy is important. Again, it's not just about the vaccines, it's about the tests, it's about the therapeutics, it's about the PPE. So really a portfolio strategy, what are the all, all of the assets you need to mitigate that risk? And to develop target product profiles. I mean, it's headline news today about who's designing the target product profile, what is the indication for the next vaccine? Do the, does the government decide? Do the companies decide? So it's really important um, to, to know the details here. Uh, many have talked about world-class workforce. This doesn't happen without the, you know, the absolutely can't just in time trained workforce. We saw the consequences of that um, here in the U.S. Um, this takes years of, of training to build that world-class workforce. You need agile ma management. Again, these threats are dynamic and we need to manage them dynamically as well. Um, to us, the real game changer is, and getting out of these cycles of panic and ne neglect, is all about test and evaluation. If we want a vaccine in 100 days, we can't wait till the next global crisis. How are we going to test um, uh, not only the rapid manufacturing of a countermeasure, but the interface between those countermeasures and the individuals, the communities, the um, populations that we will be asking um, to turn a vaccine into a vaccination. Um, critically important, and we've got to get better at that piece or all of this innovation in s and science and technology is for naught. Um, financing matters. Again, this is where um, I can't unlearn the things I learned in business school that we have got to make a case um, and, and decide, again, if this is not going to be a philanthropic endeavor, if this, you know, if we are going to ask for-profit companies to be partners in this and their obligations, fiduciary obligations, we need to understand um, what the business model is for that and look for innovative financing. Again, not only from governments, but I think there's not a C-suite executive uh, in corporate America or global corporations that don't want to do this again and want to be able to be more resilient and, and have continuity of business operations as they, as they move forward. The great power competition, I don't have a lot of time, but we focus on the mRNA, mRNA technology and we said, again, it's brilliant how this evolved so rapidly, again, unprecedentedly. Um, but the question is, um, you know, what are the what are the strategic forces that will allow us to maintain the capacity and capability in us, you know, from multiple lenses, the US, the world, um, how is how is the geopolitical sort of ecosystem looking at maintaining capability and capacity? Not mRNA, not that mRNA is the end all and be all, but mRNA certainly for the near term and certainly for COVID um, is, is an extraordinarily powerful capability. Um, and so again, we used it as a use case. We looked at first and second th uh, uh, systems analysis, first and second, third order effects of things like the Defense Production Act, um, broke down supply chain analysis. Um, and came up with a, a, a series of recommendations. And again, I don't have time to go into it, but I will um, provide the links uh, to um, to here. Again, this link between vaccines and vaccination, uh, it was not in our playbooks before. There was a presumption that if we build it, they'll use it. Um, and, and so I think this is the game changer. And there's no point, again, in making these assets if they're not going to be effectively utilized. And they, that has to be as much a priority as making them. Um, we are trying to be innovative because I think when you talk about trust building between um, the, the manufacturers of the products and um, and the uh, 
the policymakers that will be asking individuals to use them, one of the key issues for us is familiarity. Um, and and one of, this is work that I'm doing in a, a nonprofit that I'm a part of, the International Cancer Expert Corps, but there's a lot of synergies between infectious diseases and cancer. And cancer is a persistent growing epidemic threat across low and middle income countries. So if you can build healthcare systems and healthcare capacities and even understand the etiology at the molecular level, there's a lot of overlap between between, again, cancer and, uh, and infectious diseases. So there's an incredible opportunity as we see it for synergies and flex competence that is part of addressing not only taking care of, of people at risk with cancer um, in between crises, but building capabilities that will help us in epidemics and pandemics. Um, this was written almost a, a decade ago about, by one of, uh, uh, I think, the great leaders in, in global health security, Ken Bernard, who was at the White House at the time, sort of at the interface as we were initially post 9-11 preparing for biological threats and worried about um, pandemic threats like H5N1 influenza. Um, there is, a, and I think persist, a real collision of cultures between the national security environment um, and, and the global public health environment. And I think unless we figure out how to address some of those still persistent um, cultures in clash and approaches to engaging industry and for-profit entities, I think this is gonna continue to be one of the rate limiting um, challenges that we find in, in future, this pandemic and future pandemics. And as part of the discussion we had in the prior panel on IP. Um, so these are the documents. Again, I'll make sure they're available to you all and just wanted to thank you for your attention and this opportunity. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Mastrag. That was fantastic. And David, we will now turn it over to you. Um, the good news is I have no slides, so there'll be no problem there. Um, I will bounce off the previous panelists. Uh, I am actually will focus on IP, but since the conversation has been broader than that, uh, I'll just talk a little bit more broadly about warp speed. And again, I'm referencing here largely an article I wrote for American Affairs called Operation Warp Speed um, with a uh, focus on it from an industrial, industrial policy perspective. And from today's discussion, the key thing here really is the innovative procurement and contracting mechanisms at really the heart of warp speed, which I think accounted for a lot of its success. Um, and they were developed by the Department of Defense and DARPA and then brought into the health sphere. Um, but before I do that, I just want to circle a little widely in terms of what we've been hearing from the other speakers, which is as much as warp speed was a success, the fact that a warp speed was required could be arguably a failure of the American innovation system, meaning that America created invention, shall we say, at a science level of lipidization of mRNA, and then through DARPA uh, actually created prototypes and grants were given to a company called Moderna, which stands for mRNA. So the US system is able to get to that level, but when it comes to scaling it up, which is, this is kind of the premise of the article, um, the US falls flat, largely for financial reasons. It does not have a patient capital mechanism to do that. There's no real business case, say, in vaccines to scale up. It's, it's you know, the industry itself didn't really see one, um, and probably rationally so. It's not a great business. Uh, where other countries are able to successfully overcome the scale-up gap, and to tout another article, which is not yet printed, um, also in American affairs, is the Chinese have solved this problem through a new financing mechanism called guidance funds, which is their new approach to VC, but government sponsored, um, which unlike American VC, which just funds software, and I guess some bio innovation is precisely focused on manufacturing and scale up. And they're constantly talking about the valley of death. And so that's, they're put $1.6 trillion into this. Will it work? No one has any idea. But I just, that's an aside. So Warp Speed, both a success and a felt, oh no, Warp Speed of course was a huge success. Um, but the fact that a Warp Speed was required is, is shows some of the market failures in America. But let's continue on our theme of success and failure. As I said, innovative procurement and contracting was really at the heart of Warp Speed's success. I don't think it receives as much attention, maybe because people don't want to talk about other transaction authorities. Um, there's, I think, a key player here, Dr. Matthew Hepburn, who deserves credit for um, knowing how to use these well and um, working well with companies and doing it. Just so you know, 
the general premise behind this is other transaction authorities, as opposed to traditional government contracting mechanisms, they're a lot faster. And they also get around some of the uncertainties inherent in Baydol traditional contracting, namely margin rights. So I, as far as I know, no one's ever actually marched in on IP rights, but it's still a concern. And so there's this general theme that sometimes pharma companies resist federal funding because of the concern about that. Um, that's different from startups. And so Warpsy was able to zip right past that and get things done quickly through other transaction authority, which um, a Department of Defense or specifically DARPA innovation. Uh, there are cr criticisms of this from consumer groups uh, because, you know, lack of transparency about what's happening. But I mean, it was a pandemic and, you know, I think those were not really warranted. But let's talk about um, lessons learned. Now we're going to get negative because I told you success and failure. So we had a success of work speed, success of other transaction authorities. This has been recognized by the industry. Um, specifically, it was recognized by people in the antibiotic world where there's really no particularly brilliant business case for antibiotics. And they're like, well, maybe this is a way to get federal funding. We like this. How do we do this? And so they took this idea of OTAs and I won't mention the name of the manufacturer and began approaching the US government, different agencies. And the response was without the same, always the same going, antibiotics are immensely important to us. There's no greater crisis than the antibiotic lack of pipeline. And we love your idea about OTAs and um, stay in touch. Meaning no one, there's no agency to go to. There's a, a problem in the way the government, the US is organized. It's sort of adapted really for the cold war apparently. Um, maybe some new agencies from the great financial crisis, but it is not adapted to say using these innovations created by warp speed. Um, that was, you know, that's the negative. Here's a yet another counter example, because I know we talked about mostly IP, but I threw in contracting here. Um, advanced market commitments were another innovation of warp speed, you know, that really helped things as a great industrial policy tool. They're critical for the success of Pfizer. Um, so I just, here's a quick description for the audience, because I know maybe we're more of an IP focused group of people watching this, but AMCs, here's a definition. There are contracts between producers and purchasers um, signed before production or development of a given product to guarantee the quantity of future purposes and reduce financial uncertainty. So they are um, maybe one industrial me policy mechanism to get around some of these gaps of scale that I talked about. So here, we now move to the world of reality, which is, you know, the United States is working on the supply chain resiliency program, um, but there are no AMCs in it. Now, the good news here is there are groups looking at this and changing the language. So people are focused on that. But when I go back to some of the more bio things I was talking about of, um, back of um, how to use OTAs for, drugs that don't really have a lot of commercial viability there again to repeat it's not clear who to go to and with that i'll end my um, presentation thank you david uh those comments like the other presentations were fantastic uh very much appreciate you all being with us why don't we take about five or ten minutes uh for questions uh considering that the other panel went over and uh we'll wrap it up certainly by two o'clock here um, but maybe I would just first ask if any of the panelists wanted to react or comment upon something they had heard from a fellow panelist. Uh, this, this is Monique, can you hear me? Yep. Um, I, I want to amplify something David said, maybe ask a question. It, it's this idea of who do you go to? Um, governance is so important here, right? And I think with Operation Warp Speed, as you mentioned, it, it was sort of an ad hoc formation of a team that made the decisions, uh, managed the contracts. Um, you know, what is your sense from a, just from a government's and accountability perspective, if, if that sort of just in time <laughs> situation is uh, would work in the future? Yeah, if I might well, add to that, David, I, I just, yeah. you know, I, re I read Michael Lewis's uh, book, The Premonition, which I thought was a really fantastic uh, explication of, of how we were prepared as how well or not well we were prepared as a society in the lead up uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it sounded like there was a ragtag team of people originally set up in the in the, in the Bush 2 administration uh, that were the really only people in the government thinking about what a you know nation global you know wide pandemic could, could be like so that was a question i didn't want to ask you monique as well and david you know what 
how does the United States need to rethink its organizational capacity uh, to to uh, uh, for bio preparedness um, and 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 uh, you know perhaps for uh, you know more effective public private partnerships in drug development? Do you want to go first, Winnie? Great. Uh, we believe, you know, again, it's step one of our 10 step action plan. If you don't have clear sense of what policy is, and then the question is who writes policy? Do you go to uh, the health minister, the defense minister, <laughs> the, the trade minister? Um, yes, yes, and yes, right? This is a complex space that has to consider all angles. So it does become, when you talk about sort of that White House group, when I was in the government still working with Barda and Asper, um, the White House group with Rajiv and Kaya, Fran Townsend, um, Ken Bernard, uh, clear leadership in the initial pandemic, uh, national strategy for pandemic influenza, um, led out of the White House, but I know at HHS, we had a tracking action items, 400 action items. There was very clear accountability. There was a budget plan that was transparent and the spend plan that was published every six months. Um, so I, I think there's demonstration of that. Um, I, we believe it's one of the most important things. Somebody's got, and the, the other challenge um, is consistency across changes in leadership, changes in administration, because what we've heard loud and clear, what we've experienced uh, from an industry perspective when I was in industry, um, these wild swings and what's a priority and what is the requirement and um, what is the budget in this program. Uh, we need consistency over time. And that's when you look at some other countries, uh, China, for example, that has a long term plan. It's clear it's, uh, you know, um, uh, they, they uh, adhere to the plan for the most part. Uh, so I, I think we have to look at absent that clarity in policy. And this goes back to the, the global question, is the requirement for the U.S. government to protect 350 million people or 8 billion people or somewhere in between? And who are collaborators in that endeavor to vaccinate and pr protect the world as part of a global health security goal? Uh, what I will say is um, Dan Wattendorf, who is referenced here, who is very instrumental in conceiving of the vaccines, he said to me, reactive planning is not a way to plan. This is ridiculous. Um, so he was negative about that. And he pointed out to the lack of capital market access. So it is the point is the United States, who should do it right now? No one's doing it. One could argue, I mean, maybe the COVID response task force could be broadened. Maybe agencies could rethink it. But my general argument is this problem is repeated across industries. It's not just in health. And um, that the agents were not designed for a more, shall we say, other countries using a different economic model. That They need to react to the, basically the Chinese model, not sort of copy it. I mean, we can't, industrial planning is not going to go down. That word, people will cough on it. But the point is a new agency model that adjusts to today's American economic challenges, I think could solve this. And one and core to that is actually new financing mechanisms for scale up. Excellent. Simon, you mentioned uh, five recommendations for policymakers in, 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 your, in your presentation. Uh, and I know you were kind enough to, to move on for time, but are, are there a couple of those that you would like to highlight here? Uh, maybe that haven't been referenced yet by the speakers that you would particularly like to highlight. And Simon, you're on mute, by the way. Yeah, I, I think folks covered um, pretty well. I mean, the, the, the top line conclusions were obviously the prior investments and advancements towards a robust life sciences ecosystem matter greatly. Um, you've got to build it in advance of needing it, um, and that, that needs to be emphasized. That uh, I, I think Jennifer hit on this well, and that you know, what we both saw in, in our work related to the, the role of collaboration. And uh, thinking through, you know, antitrust policy, anti-competitive policies, and things, and what impacts those might have on collaboration, uh, probably needs to be thought through. Um, the convergence of digital technology and life sciences—it's um, a national education imperative, um, and something that we're going to have to address. You can't just assume that folks in analytics are going to be available to work in life sciences because every sector of the U.S. economy is looking for those people. Um, it has to be a strategic educational imperative uh, at the state and national level. Um, I think maintaining sort of the flexibility in government regulatory approaches was a key lesson that trying to make sticky some of the things that were, were done quickly during the pandemic and actually proved to work well, even when done quickly, 
um, you know, let's make quick the new normal when it comes to products that save people's lives. Um, and that uh, really, I think we were, we were pleasantly surprised at just how agile um, these systems proved to be. Um, that people were very flexible and, and able to work together and collaborate. Um, and so I, I think celebrating uh, the role that the life science ec ecosystems played and using that to support further investment and completeness in these ecosystems is critical. Conversation has had a more Western bent, but it's important to note that countries like India, China, and Russia also proved successful uh, mm -hmm. in developing COVID-19 vaccines, although the effectiveness might be to some extent questioned. But the, the question I wanted to ask was, uh, are there things that we can learn or not learn uh, from some of these other countries' efforts to develop COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics? On the vaccine okay. side, I'm not, I'm not so sure. I mean, the, the real lessons learned, I think, globally were having a plan and executing a plan. That you could see massive differences in the mortality and morbidity rates between countries that had a pre-existing plan and executed that plan without political interference and those that had a plan and didn't execute it. Um, it's readily obvious in the statistics. Jennifer, maybe uh, to close with you, the uh, previous panel uh, touched on the issue of the the uh, COVID-19 uh, TRIPS IPR waiver at the WTO. If you're based in Geneva. Uh, do you have a comment either on the meritoriousness of uh, the proposed waiver? Uh, I personally side with the view of Chris Hadding that uh, if we're already at a point where uh, the orders for the COVID-19 vaccines aren't coming in, then uh, to waive the IP rights at this point uh, makes a little sense from a policymaking point of view. But I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, but maybe you could uh, provide your perspective um, uh, from the Innovation Council and then maybe some sense of, of, of what the status of the discussions are in Geneva. I know it's referenced that there'll be a ministerial in June. Uh, where do conversations on the waiver go from here? So I think people in the first panel, if I understood correctly, were alluding to this leaked text yeah, that shows the parameters of what will probably be the eventual agreement if there is one. Um, this said, nobody is publicly endorsing that from the Quad, uh, which is the group that negotiated it ostensibly. So there's a little confusion, but there's um, some pressure to agree something by the ministerial, um, particularly from the DG, who is uh, hoping for an outcome. So Chris, I, have to, I would have to look into my crystal ball and I don't have one. Um, but on the on the question of the waiver, I'll tell you something interesting that we we did ask the different people we interviewed during our research about this. We said, what would happen if there was a waiver, if you couldn't have IP protection for your efforts um, to respond to a future pandemic? And they said, what would happen is that we would still come forward to help, right? That's our job, it's our mission, our passion, et cetera. But we wouldn't work with others in the same way. It would be too risky. So we would go as far as we could using our internal resources, our in-house manufacturing capacity, et cetera, and that's it. And so that, I mean, would obviously be counterproductive to achieving the kind of outcome we just saw with COVID. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with that. Excellent. And I think that's a great place to end our discussion overall. I want to thank our partners at the Center for Strategic International Studies, CSIS, for pointing, putting on this event today in joint collaboration with ITIF. I want to thank all of our panelists from panel one and panel two, and finally to the audience for joining us today. The presentations we referenced will be available on both the ITIF and CSIS websites, uh, as well as full video of this event by the afternoon. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us today and engaging on the important topic of innovation and IP's role in combating the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you.